All right, so before I jump in this video, you're probably wondering, who the heck is this girl? You probably bumped into my video or you're returning. If you're returning, welcome back. If you're new, welcome, please subscribe. But I am a tenured associate professor of public health. I have been the graduate, coordina graduate coordinator, graduate director, however you want to call it, of my department. I was that for one year. That was a long time. <laughs> so I served through one admit through two admission cycles, so spring and fall, and I run a research lab called Health Equity Action Lab, where I have about I have several doctoral students, several PhD students, several master students, several undergraduate students. So I know a thing or two about the graduate admissions process. So I reached out to 28 faculty on the admissions committee around the world. 18 in the US, three in the UK, that's 21, several in Canada, and one in South Korea. And so I, I wanted, you guys know I'm a researcher, and I wanted this video to really capture what happens around the world, um, to be a representation of what happens in several universities and in several countries. And all of these um, people, they have one thing in common, they serve on the graduate admissions committee, okay? And so some of them I don't even know personally, but I know of them, so I emailed them to just ask them a question, um, some sort of qualitative interview, because I wanted to know how schools around the world um, decide who they let into their graduate um, school and how graduate admission actually works. And so I looked at all of these responses and there was a common thing, okay? so. Of course, I serve. I currently serve on the ad, um, graduate admissions committee in my department, um, but I, you know, you sometimes you can't really speak for every school, or every country, right? And so, but what I found from my little study for you guys on this channel, because I love you guys, what I found was, you know, it's really the same around the world. It's really the same. The only difference is it's just the type of technology used, okay? When you go on the school's website, you see the criteria, right, of what they require. Most times, the 3.0, most times, some schools require that you have a course, some kind of prerequisite, per, <laughs> some schools require you have some kind of prerequisite um, courses or, you know, degree or something like that. So when you submit your application to the school, it actually doesn't go to the department, okay? It goes to the graduate school first, all right? The graduate school are all administrators. They know nothing about your course of study. They, they know nothing. All they do is just check for, um, check for criteria, okay? So a lot of times what they do is if you do not meet like the GPA criteria, your application bounces. They're even, um, they're like, they're software programs that filter out applications, okay? Because post-pandemic, the, a lot of people are returning to graduate school. I read in a, in a newspaper article that I think the pandemic, staying at home, made people kind of realize they hated what they did or realize that they wanted something else, something better for their lives. And so they, um, and so yeah, so a lot of people are going back to school. Like there are hundreds and hundreds of applications all over um, the US. I mean, the, I, the typical, typically in a lot of schools, you get, so many applications and you can only accept about five to seven percent of those applications right so that's the landscape okay so so more than ever the admissions decision process is intense right and and so anyway back to what i was saying <laughs> so the graduate school looks at all the logistics of your application no content area nothing they're just like does this person have the correct um the prerequisite um to be competitive in this program. That's the first stage, okay? Once the graduate school figures out that, okay, this person is competitive, then they compile your application and send it to the department. So many times, the department doesn't even get to see like 50% of the applications, okay? Because you do not meet those criteria, okay? All right, so when the, when the department gets your application, it, is, it goes to the graduate coordinator, okay? The graduate advisor. Um, the graduate advisor is typically not faculty, okay? It's just like an administrator, but in the department, okay? So the graduate advisor gets these applications and then contacts faculty admissions committee. So there's an admissions committee in the department, okay? 
the admissions committee in the department would now meet. So they could meet in person, they could meet um, virtually via Zoom or Google Meet or whatever. They could also meet via email. So in, like in my department, we just do email now. We used to meet in person and go over applications, but we just do email now because that's like easier. So, they, so in my department, they send us a form um, the graduate advisor will send us a form and send us the applicant's um, documents in a Google Drive. And so what you do is just click on the Google Drive. Each Google, each file each um, file has the candidate's name, and you just click on the Google Drive and you see the candidate's um, documents. Okay, and then but some schools they do it differently. They meet in person. I know several schools have the admissions committee meet in person. Like they have lunch they provide lunch and then you go over each applicant okay so it really depends on the school but it's still the same thing right where the graduate advisor sends out these applications to the admissions committee and the admissions committee uh, will make recommendations on um, on the applicants many times there has to be a a you, it can be even, right? So think about it. If there's six admissions committee members and three vote yes and three vote no, then it's kind of an, an impasse, okay? So there's typically an odd number of admissions committee members so that there's always more no or more yes, okay? And so that's what happens because there are many times and there are many situations where I like a candidate, my colleague is like, oh, no, right? And so a lot of times it just depends on the majority of the vote really it depends on majority of the vote so um so there's typically odd number of committee members and um and then they get to vote on applicants so this is typically for the master's program for the phd program though um it's still there's still a review process but of course you have to have a connection to the department right um so so normally in your statement of purpose if you've not watched my statement of purpose video go watch that video that video is going to change your life, okay? So in the statement of purpose, in your statement of purpose, you, you should mention the faculty that you plan to work with, okay? Um, the faculty's research that you're interested in, okay? So you have that person. And so when, during the review, faculty will ask you, like, so if you apply to my institution and you say, oh, I want to work with Dr. Muda, they'll ask you, like, hey, did you, do you want to work with this person? What are your thoughts on this person? Okay, so... I begin, I, I jump in the driver's seat of this person's application, right? Because they've, they've mentioned me in, my, in their statement of purpose. So it's like, okay, it's up to you, Anne. What do you want? Okay? And so, so of course, there are checks and balances, right? Because I can't just be like, yes, I want that person, right? So, of course, my colleagues would be like, well, this, the person doesn't meet this criteria and doesn't meet this criteria and that and that and that. And then the person can't be admitted, even if I want that person, because there has to be checks and balances. It's kind of like the president and the Senate. The Senate is the and the House of Representatives, right? They are what creates the checks and balances to remove absolute power from the president. It's the same thing, okay? Of course, there are instances where I can fight and be like, no, I want this person, nah, 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 right? And then, of course, that's like a when the president signs like a... V a bill like uh, what are those things called remind me type it in the comments i forgot what it is but um when they use their powers like a veto is it a veto i don't know okay but you get what i'm trying to say all right so there are times where faculty can say insist and say hey i want this person i don't care i'm um, 99 of the time the, the the other faculty have a say even if you even if the faculty you mention in your sop wants you they still you know they still have to evaluate you and evaluate your, your fit in the department as a whole and not just your fit with the faculty, even though that's the primary fit, okay? All right, so once they decide all that, there's a lot of back and forth, okay? There's a lot of back and forth. Because think about it, there's hundreds of people that apply to a PhD program, thousands that apply to a master's program, I, in, typically, okay? So they're rejecting like 90 eight percent of applicants so that's a lot and think of, and that's a lot of work for the fac admissions committee members because we don't get paid to do this stuff like that's we don't get paid so this is our service free free service okay and so um so there's this this is work for us and we just feel like so we we are always trying to make it as efficient and effective as possible so that there's not we're not doing this forever okay and so and so there's back and forth and back and forth you know, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then typically within a month, decisions are made, okay? Um, even if you don't hear back 
did they've still made a decision and um, you may hear back in two months but typically in a month the the admissions decisions are made all right so when you get your decision you know if it's a reject and you ask why I encourage people to ask why like hey why was I rejected how can I do better okay most schools will say it was just a competitive landscape you know try again another time it was just bad timing other schools will give you more detailed information typically there's more detailed information if you get especially if you're rejected from a phd program there's typically more detailed information available if you're rejected from a master's program it's a little bit more of a hand toss right because you're you're really i mean there's so many people going back for a master's you guys cannot even fathom the amount of people going back to school so the landscape is very competitive so for a master's they typically just like reject you for the most stupid things, right? Because they, don't, they just don't have space, okay? So they can reject you because there was a grammatical error in your statement of purpose, <laughs> right? Especially if there's a toss-up between you and somebody. For, for a doctoral program, typically they would interview you for a doctoral program. Um, and a lot of times, if you're an international student, for example, and you get rejected a PhD program, honestly, they typically have taken an American or a Canadian or like a local resident over you. That's what happens, right? Because think about it, think about it. You're all the way in Nigeria, all the way in India, all the way in China, wherever you are, you're applying to a school in, in the US, okay? For example, or Canada, for example. And they haven't met you, they don't know anything about you, but an American or an indigenous person in their own country can fly out to their department and meet with faculty in person. Okay, so they get to see the person, in, they get to touch, hand, shake the person, maybe even hug the person. So, of course, you, you're you already behind, okay, because they met this person. So, what you're hoping is that that person sucks in person and they take you vert, like somebody who they met over Zoom, all right? But in most cases, that doesn't happen. And so, that's why getting into a PhD program as an international student is more difficult, okay? And the application, and as you see, the admissions committee are human right? They're human, like they're me. Yeah, right? And so, so we're not robots, all right? So if I met somebody in person and we connected, I just have more, more, like, more affinity towards that person than somebody I met over Zoom that is 3,000 miles away. And so I'm more likely to accept this person I met over you, over, like, the other person who is international. So something else that's very vital in the admission decision process is funding, money, um, but this typically applies to only doctoral programs or doctoral admissions decisions, okay? So most universities, especially very research intensive universities, they do not like to take PhD students when they cannot fund either partially or fully fund your, um, your PhD. And, um, and so that's a huge part. The most important is really just how strong your application is and if the um, admissions committee likes you. If it's an institution that is very big on funding, they would not take you if they can't fund you, then that's a whole nother story, right? Because then, you know, they like your application, but they can't fund you. So they tell you, hey, we have no funds, sorry. Um, but yeah, that's really out of all of the responses I got, which I got about 28 responses, These, this is actually... This is what it is. This is it. This is this is the process of how graduate admission is made. All right. Um, thank you for watching and like and subscribe. And I'll catch you next week.